The Lunch and Learn series is funded through partnership with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service in Pennsylvania and in collaboration with professionals who have been very generous with their time and talent in agreeing to present through this series. In the office, I'm joined by our Natural Resources Specialist, David Golden, and I'll turn it over to David. Hi, thanks, Cheryl. Um, I'm just going to introduce the, the speaker today, and then uh, we can get started. Our speaker today is Mike Orzelik, who is a professor emeritus of vegetable crops of, at the uh, Pennsylvania State University. Uh, he has conducted multiple field trials and published several papers on plastic mulches and the effects of using colored plastics in horticulture. Uh, today he will be discussing plastics for high tunnels as well as uh, for field mulch films. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, David. I, um, I'm going to talk on plastics for high tunnel in the field mulch film that we uh, play down the field every year. So when you look at when we started growing high tunnels or constructing high tunnels here at Penn State, one of the concerns we had was that in the original design that came out of New Hampshire, they used one big piece of film for everything. So that if you had damage to the top or damage to the roll of side, you had to replace the entire piece of plastic. So we decided, and you can see in this uh, picture, that we sectionalized it. So we have the top, the one section, separate section from the roll up sides and from the ends. So if any of the plastic is damaged, you can change the plastic relatively simply and, in, and efficiently and cheaper than having to replace all the plastic on a tunnel itself. The other consideration I want to uh, say is that when you look at this tunnel, you can see that the, the top is actually uh, installed on all four sides, so there's no uh, exposure uh, of the side to wind. When you look at the roll of sides, the side of um, the roll of side, the end of the poly, is exposed to wind on a 24-7 basis. With that in mind, we have found over the years that we have to replace the roll of side about every two years, and we replace the top every four to six years. So uh, keep in mind the fact that your roll-up sides will actually uh, become worn out and damaged quicker than the top. Uh, the characteristics for a high tunnel polyethylene film are first durable. You want to be able to withstand high winds, hail, and snow loads. And certainly in Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic region, the high winds and the hail is, not, um, is always there prevalent uh, any time of the year almost. The snow loads in winter time. Uh, and this year was a good example. We had as much as two, uh, two uh, feet of snow at one time. If it's wet snow, puts a very heavy load on that uh, poly in the tunnel itself. So I think having a durable poly is very critical. You want to provide high light transmission. So as it's sun shining during the day, those plants take up the light and produce uh, carbohydrates. You want to have long-lasting, uh, at least, uh, least four-year material. Uh, most of the six mil poly that we get now for high tunnel tops is usually four years and sometimes it's longer. And, and you look at color, most of the color is clear, but there have been um, uh, companies that actually come up with the blue and red mulch or poly, uh, polyethylene you can put on top of the tunnel. And finally, you want to stand up the UV degradation for multiple years. So this, uh, the UV ultraviolet light is going to degrade the carbon molecules in the plastic and over time it's going to literally fall apart. So you want to have a, a good film that has a good UV uh, additive to it so it has multiple year use to it. Uh, this is a, a material called Smart Light and it's a red polyethylene film which we received from a company in um, Italy and this film uh, is a, a six mil and it would last about uh, four years and probably be used with specific crops uh, and mainly maybe flower crops because you have much better color in uh, flower stem size with use of red versus clear. So the question becomes, does plastic film color matter? And obviously it does because all plants contain phytochrome, which is a pigment activated with light in the blue and red range of visible light. So phytochrome, depending on whether it absorbs red light or far red light, can make plants far more, increase plant height or stem diameter. And so there have been some manufacturers who've appreciated the fact that since there is phytochrome in plants, they can manipulate the level of phytochrome 
can cause a plant response depending on color of the film. The okay, high tunnel plastic film types. There's several different types I want to discuss here, and um, I'll give you the a manufacturer, maybe more than one, but certainly is the one I picked up. This film is a standard six mil clear polyethylene film with high light transmission, improved strength and toughness, and up to 32 percent longer life because of advanced UV protection. The additives they put in. And, lo and this material will lower greenhouse temperatures by as much as 9 degrees when compared to standard film. So for the uh, summer production, we have crops going in your tunnel. This might be a film to consider because it does lower temperature. And AT Plastics manufactures this type of covering film for high tunnels. And actually what I'm going to show you now is what uh, it might look like. So here is the. Uh, and it's called luminance is the trade name that AT Plastics uses. So here's the luminance uh, on a tunnel growing. It looks like uh, raspberries. And you can see how bright it is inside of the, the tunnel itself. So it has a good light diffusion, light transmission characteristics, and it, it's pretty tough and it would stay in some of the environmental conditions that we certainly have in the Mid-Atlantic region here. Another one would be a standard six mil plastic with five layer technology. Now, there's five layers of material within that six mil plastic. It has 90% light transmission, 20% light diffusion, and anti-dust protection. It carries a four year warranty, meaning that if your film does not last for the four years, you can contact the company and they'll replace it. So the manufacturer of this particular uh, film would be Sun Selector Manufacturers and uh, it, it's made for covering of high tunnels. And it can probably be used for greenhouses, too, obviously. Here's a photo of the Sun Selective film. And it looks almost similar to the uh, luminance, except this is a clearer material. You can see through it rather easily. Okay, another high tunnel plastic film, which is interesting, and I'm not sure how many people would use it, because uh, I have to say, as you get into some of these uh, more uh, interesting films, they actually cost more than some of the cheaper films or more simple films. This is what we call a bubble film that has an R value of 1.7, 83% light transmission, 83% light diffusion, 100 mile an hour wind rating, which means that it, it will not tear uh, up until 100 miles an hour, maybe uh, at a higher wind speed it might have a problem. And it will would stay at 120 pounds per square foot snow load. And it has a 10-year warranty against UV degradation. And it's recommended for tops only, not for uh, ends or for rolled sides. And Polydress Solar Wrap manufactures this type of covering for high tunnels. And I have to say that this this material, this film, would be more expensive than the other two I, I discussed earlier. So here's a going to be a uh, photo of the bubble wrap. And you can see the bubbles in there, and they're slightly insulated, like you have bubble wrap for packaging. And that gives you insulation in a little stronger um, material that will last for, uh, they say, up to 10 years. And then the last material I want to talk about is a, a woven plastic with 88% light transmission, 45% light diffusion, anti drip coating, IR, uh, IR additives that help to maintain warmer nights and cooler days. It also has UV blocking agent that reduces pest incidence and carries a six year warranty. So this has a lot of different characteristics which would be useful in a high tunnel. And this is a solar rig, solar roof uh, manufacturer. Um, and it actually comes from, uh, I believe, Israel, the original concept for this. And uh, this would, would look like this material here, uh, it's more of, it looks like more of a white type material, but it's a, it's a woven material, so it's strong. And, um, but it has, still has pretty good light diffusion and light transmission. And again, this would be uh, more expensive than a standard 6 mil clear uh, polyethylene film that you'd use for the top, uh, which has less of these characteristics. So with that, um, I want to show you also, this is what may happen. Windy day, this happened probably, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago here at Rock Springs. We had a very windy day, and we had one of our tunnels where maybe the poly wasn't quite, uh, it's been aged, it's been there for a while, maybe three, four years. 
but we had this much damage to the plastic itself, and obviously at this point, you just got to take a whole, all the plastic off, throw it away, and then come back for the new tunnel. Fortunately, we had nothing growing in here, so that was very good. But if we had anything growing in there and we had this uh, lost the top, especially in, either in the spring or late in the fall, it could have been a disaster. So I think planning ahead and determining that at some point you need to change your top, you may want to do that before you get damaged like this when you have a crop in sight. Uh, and, and you can go anywhere from 0.5 to 1.5 mil. The, the consideration you have to think about, though, is that one, at 0.5, it may be very difficult to retrieve the plastic in the fall after you're done with it. The thicker the film, the one, one and a quarter, one and a half mil, is actually easier to retrieve in the field at the end of the season. So that may be one consideration when we talk about plastic mulch film. Then you get into colors. Black has been a standard for many years. We have white, we have clear, we have blue, we have red, and we have metallized uh, a silver. So there's several different colors you can purchase, and they all have a different uh, response with crops. There also is the uh, potential for getting co-extruded. So you can get white on black, which means then you're going to put the white side up and the black side down, and that's going to cause cooler soil temperatures now because you're reflecting light in feet away from the soil underneath the plastic. You also can get silver on black. The silver on black is good because the silver confuses insects trying to land on plants growing on the plastic. So you get some, uh, especially for aphids, you get pretty good uh, virus control when using silver on black. Then you get into roll width. Rolls of poly come between three and six feet. And obviously, if you've set your plastic mulch layer up for four feet or five feet or three feet, you want to stay with that particular width and not to keep changing uh, uh, week to week or even month to month. Uh, I've, I've had four feet for the last 10, 10 years. And then you get into roll length, and you can buy rolls from 2,400 to 4,000 linear feet. And that that's a nice length to use, the 4,000. Uh, about two rolls cover an acre. So once you carry two rolls on your laying machine, mulch laying machine, you're done with the acre, and you go on to a second acre with just two rolls. This is a shot of a reflective silver mulch that actually is being used in Asia. And you can see that they're covering the whole field, which normally we would never do. And also notice the fact that this, the uh, beds are center to center about three feet. So that's why they went ahead and used covered the whole field. The field because of the, um, the um, shortness of the, uh, the width between the raised beds. Of course, the crop are growing probably or something like a cucurbit crop, uh, even cucumbers, because you're getting now protection from aphids, which would transmit many viruses. Normally, we would not do this. The other problem I could see with this situation is if you see this in parts of mid-Atlantic where you get a heavy rain, where's the water going? So I would imagine this is a situation where there's not that much rainfall and they're getting drip irrigation under each bed to maintain water levels to grow the crop. The uh, next, um, in the next photo, you see that we have different colors. And I've looked at five, six, seven different colors over the last 20 years. And probably the most uh, popular colors uh, as you well know, are black. And I'd say probably 9% of all people growing are using black. Uh, white is getting uh, popular in the south because you can get cooler soil temperatures if you're growing in the summer. And here in Pennsylvania, in the middle we probably want warmer than cooler. Uh, red is good. Uh, we're seeing uh, red being used for eggplant, strawberries, and tomatoes. You get a nice response with that. Uh, this is a crop of onions we tried uh, many years ago. And then the other color, which has some use, and by the way, the, the red and blue might be 5%, 8% of the total acreage in the U.S. Uh, colors, but blue would be used for cucurbits, so things like cantaloupe, watermelon, uh, cucumbers, squash would really do well on blue mulch versus black. So here's a, cop, here's a shot of watermelon being grown on blue mulch. 
and we get real good growth of the vines, real good growth uh, in production of fruit. And uh, it, it can also see in this photo that there's no weeds in there. So just like black will eliminate weeds, uh, blue does also eliminate weeds in the row where you have the mulch laid. It's not a problem. Now here is some um, clear poly, and this is very thin uh, clear poly, uh, something on an order of about um, uh, 1.6 uh, mil, extremely thin. And what happens is that this material is so thin that it allows the corn to come through, and then eventually it's going to uh, degrade because there's very little UV um, inhibitor to it. So this will be almost like a biodegradable film, which the people use for corn to get early corn production. So what are the advantages of plastic mulch? Okay, warm soil, uh, sometimes as much as 8 to 10 degrees compared to non-plastic. And early, that's very critical. Reduces, eliminates weeds. Again, uh, in the row where the plastic's laid, there will be very few weeds. The only place you might find the weed is where you have uh, holes in the poly where you put your uh, transplant or seed. Uh, that may be a problem with an area where weeds might come through. Uh, but that could be handled by hand weeding or even herbicide. Now you want to make, it, the plastic maintains higher soil moisture levels so that if you're uh, growing a crop of uh, watermelon, uh, you only have to maybe irrigate during the summer a couple times because once you irrigate, the evapotranspiration rates are much lower under plastic than in the field without plastic. It does reduce nutrient leaching because now you're using drip irrigation, which uh, is, uh, ha is, is having water come out of the soil at very low volumes and low rates, so you get good infiltration without uh, pushing nutrients away from the root zone. And finally, you, you can reduce disease potential because you're not wetting leaves with uh, drip under the poly. It's a, it's a combination deal. And uh, with overhead irrigation, uh, you start to irrigate overhead, you get water on those leaves. And certainly things like mildew and um, early blade can be a problem with those wet leaves over time. So here's another uh, uh, photo of actually uh, blue moss being uh, used in the high tunnel growing um, zucchini squash. It does extremely well. Again, no weeds. You can see the nice growth of that zucchini. Nice sized plants. Okay, the other uh, area we get into is uh, biodegradable or non-biodegradable. Uh, with the non-biodegradable uh, plastic mulch, obviously you have to pick it up uh, at the end of the season. Uh, this is one mil poly, which is easily retrievable after the uh, uh, melon crop is taken off. If it's non-degradable, um, you, you can just go ahead and and, and actually rototill into the soil. But the other consideration is that just like with non-degradable, when we use biodegradable plastic mulch, we still want to have drip irrigation under the poly to maintain moisture levels for the crop, which means that you have to actually pull up your drip tape first before you can rototill your, your biodegradable film. So there are some ups and downsides of using both non-degradable and biodegradable. The other thing you want to point out is that if you're going to uh, use plastic mulch in a field, at least try to get a really good uh, tight film over the soil without wrinkles. And you can see here that there's a lot of wrinkles in here, which means that when sun's shining down, there's air pockets between the soil and the top of the poly. And so the, the actual energy of the sun is not going, being transmitted into the soil, but it's being maintained in that air. The air is heating up. So in, some, in most cases, you're not going to get the same temperature, soil temperature, when you have this type of uh, poly in the field versus one that's tightly over the bed, nice and firm, nice and tight. And also, uh, when we start, you know, this is a good example of how nice the uh, film is laid tight over the bed. You can see it takes the shape of the bed. So when the sun's out, that energy of the sun goes right into the soil and heats it up rather dramatically. Uh, some people will want to do multiple beds at one time. Some people just will do lay a single bed at one time. 
But uh, regardless, this is what the type of uh, response you want of getting poly tight over the bed once you start putting it in the field. And I talked about the width of plastic. And the reason I said that because there's also a variation within the U.S. on bed height. This is a picture taken out of Florida, and they're putting in 12-inch tall beds. So you figure that's uh, 24 inches on either side. You want a 3-foot top. Or at least a 32-inch top. So you're talking probably these guys are using 6-foot wide poly, or at least 5-foot wide poly, not 4-foot wide poly. So the bed height will actually have a very significant effect on the width of the poly you're going to use to lay in the field. And then here's a, uh, a row of onions, uh, two rows of onions being grown on the raised bed. This is not a 12-inch raised bed. This is about a 6, but you can see, again, the plastic's nice and tight. So we're getting warming of the soil rather quickly when the sun's out because it's got good contact. Here's a watermelon crop in uh, Berks County, which, is, which has plastic growing on It's growing on plastic. You can see the good production of the melons and, and the vines itself look very nice, very healthy. And with this particular design of uh, plastic mulch and drip, you don't get the water on the foliage, so you get less disease potential. You can see that these are actually ready for harvest, and the vines, the vines still look very good and green, very healthy. As I said, I've looked at many colors over the years. Uh, there's blue and orange and yellow and uh, uh, red and black and gray and green, and almost any color you can think of. The one thing I want to point out is, though, that why is there a lot of yellow mulch being used in the U.S.? Well, think about the greenhouse, and when you want to monitor for pests, you take out a yellow sticky card. So here's a situation where we're going to have, if we lay yellow mulch in the field, the yellow would draw in every insect possible because of its color. And we did some work with this years ago with uh, cucumber beetle, and we could get huge populations of cucumber beetle with, with zucchini squash growing on yellow. So. Uh, we we cut we I think the industry itself did not see the need for a yellow mulch, so uh, we don't see you can't buy commercial yellow, but it has been made in the past. Now here's a, an example of a combination of, of mulch, field mulch, and row cover, so that the uh, zucchini crop you see in the background had no uh, row cover when it was transplanted, and the zucchini squash you see in the foreground had a uh, a, a row cover placed over it after transplanting. And we had the row cover on it for four weeks. So the difference in growth between the zucchini in the background and the zucchini in the foreground is a matter of four weeks of row cover. So sometimes it does pay to add additional um, uh, poly or uh, row cover to a system to maintain more active growth or reproduction. And actually, uh, it uh, helps to reduce insect problems once you have the row cover on. And again, this is just a photo of this um, system they're using uh, over in Asia where they have uh, very close beds. And um, I can change it. And, and, they, and they're using probably a crop like uh, cucumber, possibly melon, where you have virus potential. And so they don't want viruses. So this uh, reflective material will help to reduce insect problems. There also is uh, uh, people have tried using white uh, film. And here in this situation, they're growing tomatoes in a high tunnel, but they're using white in between the rows, or actually up to the rows. And the reason why they're using white, because they've shown that white will decrease the uh, white fly population that may occur when growing tomatoes. So not only do we get a decrease in insect pressure, but also we get a response by getting light reflected back on the tomato crop and getting a higher yield versus bare ground. And then, of course, the film manufacturers have come up with some interesting designs. So here's a uh, uh, metalized silver mulch with a 12-foot strip of black poly in the middle. So if you use this in the field, you would have heat going in the 12-inch black strip to enhance plant growth, but you have the metallic silver on the side 
to reduce insect pressure, especially with aphids. So it's sort of a combination type of uh, plastic we've seen over the years. And so one of the problems, though, that you have to realize when using a non-degradable film is that you have to retrieve it in the fall, and then what do you do with it? So as a result, we've had some people switch over to biodegradable, um, and there's been a lot of research done on biodegradable versus non-degradable. I think for the most part, yields are uh, probably very uh, equitable between non-degradable and biodegradable. The big difference is going to be cost, so that the biodegradable is probably like $100 plus more per roll versus non-degradable. And then you have to think about, you know, what do you want to do with uh, film in the future? Do you want to use a biodegradable, and then you just lure it till in your field, or do you want to use a non-degradable, and then pay a tipping fee to have it taken away, and you're done with it? And of course, one of the things we've seen over the years, I've, I've grown, uh, I've used poly for the last probably 30 years here at the Hurt Research Farm. And this is a, a picture of uh, film that's been used over the 10, 15 year period. And it's never, the body rape was never quite degraded in the field. Even as, and then we, when you remove it, you invariably leave some of the poly on the uh, sides where you laid it in the soil. And over time, that will not degrade, but then when you work the field up, it gets blown around. There's simply a photo showing residual poly, even after 10 years, that's never degraded. And this is not, not non-degradable film. So again, you've got to think about, is it worthwhile me getting biodegradable film, or do I really do a better job of getting non-degradable film out of the field? And I think that's a question each of you have to answer and feel comfortable with. So with that, uh, I'm open to any questions. Okay, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to present today. Thank you very much, and, and thank you everyone for participating. Um, we hope to follow up soon. The next workshop is the Barry preseason check-in with Kathy Demchek.